and came to meet me, I would say, oh, it's just around that turn, just over that mountain. But that could mean another hour, because we were out in the country. So I know what that means. So Genesis 47, verse 13, it says, And there was no bread in all the land, for the famine was very sore, so that the land of Egypt and all the land of Canaan faded by reason of the famine. And Joseph gathered up all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, for the corn which they bought, and Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's house. And when money failed in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came unto Joseph and said, Give us bread, for why should we die in thy presence? For the money faileth. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for tonight, God. I thank you for this great church and this great people. Now, Lord, I ask that you anoint their hearts and ears to hear what you have to say to them, Lord. Use my mouth as your oracle, God. Let only your words utter from me, I say. In the name of Jesus, I thank you, and I praise you, and do your great work. Amen. Y'all may be seated. So when money fails, and this isn't a popular message because we live in America, the land of opportunity, the land of great things. Before I came home, I was in Zimbabwe, where their money system has fought, it's failing. I mean, it takes hundreds of dollars to buy $30 worth of groceries. They couldn't believe I would spend 900 of their dollars to get a pound of butter. But I'm sorry, when I'm in a foreign country, I want real butter. There's certain things I really want and I'll pay for them. And they couldn't understand how I could go and pay this kind of money for something like that when they were barely scraping by and barely able to buy groceries. People were so kind to take me to the churches I was evangelizing at and I'd buy them gas. And I, we were in the grocery store, they, I asked them to stop so I could pick up a few things because at that time I didn't have a car in Zimbabwe. And I, I asked them to stop so I was getting some stuff and I noticed that she was the secretary of the Bible school. She was looking around and she, I said, are you hungry? I mean, I bought him lunch, and I said, does that baby need food? And she goes, I have to wait. We have no money. I said, no, we don't have to wait. Get you a buggy and go fill it up. I'm buying. I said, you're not going hungry till you get paid. That's not happening on my watch. I'll go hungry before I watch children go hungry. I said, if I get real desperate, I can make a phone call, and somebody will send me some money. I said, but I'm going to feed you tonight. And I tied her and she grabbed a bag of chicken. She goes, are you sure? I said, yes. I said, get a big bag of rice. I know how y'all love your rice. Get a big bag of chicken. Don't get that little. She just came with this little stuff. And so she got the big stuff and she put it in the buggy. Because you see, their system has fallen. Basically. I mean, I think $2 of their money is worth a penny. I've got a stack of it. I could probably set it on fire. And it's probably worth more to burn to keep me warm. I'm serious, but you don't realize how quickly that can happen in any country. And as I've traveled and as I'm watching what they're doing, they're going towards cryptocurrency. And we don't like to think about these things, but that's what's happening. And if they're setting up third world nations to accept only cryptocurrency, what do you think they've already done in the United States of America? It's set, it's ready to roll, I'm sure. And they're just waiting for the right sequence of events to make it happen. But you see, we don't want to think that. But we have to start thinking this way because we haven't ministered to the Lord in a long time. Yeah. Not really. And I'm going to go to Acts 13, verse 1 through 4 here in a minute. And in Acts 13, it's the only place in the Bible that it speaks of it this way. And this is how it reads. It says, Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene and Menin, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost spake. They said, separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed into Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. Verse 2 is the one. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, we haven't ministered to the Lord in a long time. We haven't laid before God. We haven't stopped church and waited to see if he wanted to speak. Because it doesn't fit in with our modern day. It doesn't fit in with where we are. I'm old school. I want God to speak. I want to hear his voice. I want to know that he said, I need you to go here. Or it's time for you to stop a little while and sit still. And when my pastor said, maybe it's time for you to sit still a little while today. I just kind of looked at him like, no. But, you know, as it's grown on me this afternoon, I feel like it's the door the Lord wants me to walk through. And 
and I'm excited about it now, and I can't wait to get back the 1st of January after I see my family for Christmas, because sometimes the doors God opens, we don't feel anything. But because we've learned how to minister to Him, and when I started, that's my memory passage for this week, Acts 13, 1 through 4, I read it seven times every day by hand. That's the only way you get it in you. And as you write it, God starts talking to you. And he says, do you see what I'm trying to show you? They stopped and they listened for me. How long has it been since we have stopped in our personal prayer lives and listened for God? How long has it been since we found a place at home to pray or our children have heard us pray? I mean, it's been a long time. I mean, I have a lot of time on planes and a lot of time alone in cars where I worship God or where I listen to messages. And you can tell when I'm traveling and I have that 12-hour drive, I may post 10 messages I've listened to. And I'm praying and tears are streaming down my face. And I'm talking in tongues while I'm listening and I'm driving and those miles are just going under the car. Because I have to have a walk with Him. I have to be fed. I can't feed other people unless I'm fed. And you see, you... Our disciples of the Lord, too. You need to be feeding other people. But what have you been listening to? What have you been watching that you're feeding them? You see, I want to feed them Jesus. I want to feed them great things. I want to tell them about miracles. I want to tell them about when I texted our pastor from the Middle East on the way to Africa this year. And I said, pray. They just told me I can't travel. My documents are invalid. I've only had my passport six years. You're supposed to have three empty pages. I had three empty pages, or so I thought. But they said endorsements at the top, and they have to say visas. And it's never the foreign country governments I get in trouble with. It's always the American government. Bless God, anyway. It's always our people. And when they said that, I, I said, excuse me, I've got three pages. He says, no, man, you don't. He said, the embassy's closed Monday because it's a holiday. This was on Friday night. You can either stay here till Tuesday or we can send you back home. And I thought, I've just traveled 20 some hours. Going home is not an option. And Jesus gave me a mission. And I'm going to accomplish this mission. I didn't tell him that, but that's what I was thinking in my head. Exhaust, when a woman gets exhausted, what do we do, Sister Macy? We cry. You know, tears start to drip out of our eyes. There's no control in it. That's just a woman. And so he says, go over there and have a seat. Somebody will be with you in a few minutes. So I walk, because I was one of the first people in line that night, which is rare for me. I usually get on last, because your seat's already assigned. Why start the torture too soon? I wait till the last person is up, and I'm behind them. And so I went over, and I sit down, and that's when I texted our pastor and Sister Kleinenson and one other person. I can't remember who the third person was. And as I walked back there, I told them today, I said, my big fat prayer was this. Really, God? I work for you. Aren't you God? I thought you were. Can't you take care of this if you're God? And that was it. About 10 or 15 minutes later, one of those beautiful people in those Homeland Security uniforms come to me. If you work for Homeland Security, I apologize for bashing you. But I'm serious. You're the only people I get in trouble with. You can ask my daughter. She was with me one trip where they really, they made me go through the line three times. We thought I wasn't getting on the plane that day. But... It, you know, I sat down there and I was just, just like, really? Is this really happening? And that's the way we are with a lot of things in our lives. And we don't realize it may be a time that if we've ministered to the Lord and if we've sown seed to God, it may be a time where he's going to send us an angel. Right. He's going to send us something we're not going to recognize. And so that night as I sat there, a man came to me and he said, where's your passport? And I said, here, he goes, hand it to me. So I handed it to him. He goes away. A few minutes, I don't know, 10 or 15 more minutes, another man comes. He has my passport. He says, come with me. So I get up and I go with him. And all of a sudden I realize, you don't know where he's taking you. I said, whoa. And he said, what, ma'am? I said, where are you taking me? <laughs> he said, ma'am, you've been working really hard for God. And you've traveled a lot. And it's time for you to enter a season of rest. And I'm looking at him like... He fell out of the truck. I was so exhausted, I didn't even realize I was talking to an angel. I didn't have a response, so I just followed him. And he takes me past all those people in line. You know, they put hundreds of people on those big jets. I thought, watch, walked in front of all those people that watched me walk away. And they take me up, and in the Middle East, security is tight. Super tight. You get, you get to undress three or four times before you actually board. So it was another one of those places where you needed to undress. 
He handed them my passport. They stamped it. And he walked me straight back through. They didn't unpack my technology. They didn't unpack nothing. He put me in my seat on the plane and he said, rest now, ma'am. Wow. And I'm sitting there looking at him like, what? A few minutes later, the stewardess comes up. See, God knew I wasn't getting it. It took me months to figure it out. Hmm. And uh, that's the way we are, though. We don't realize it when God sends us something special. Because the media has got us so inundated that we think it's just a mirage. Yeah. We think it's like a movie. Right. And it's not really happening to us. And so as I sat in my seat and that stewardess comes up to me, she says, ma'am, can I see your passport? And I'm thinking, sure, it's useless to me based by the American government, it's invalid. And so I handed it to her and she's flipping through it because it's full, tons of stamps. And she says, ma'am, you've worked so hard for God. She goes, he's gonna give you a season of rest now. And I'm sitting there looking at her. Rest to me is a four letter word that should not be uttered in my presence. <laughs> it's like cursing. <laughs> because when I'm resting, I don't know what to do with myself. I don't know what to do because I'm a busy person. When I'm busy is when I excel. When I'm working till midnight and back up at 4 a.m. to pray, that's when I excel. When I'm getting plenty of sleep, I'm just lazy. That's, that's how I see it. But, but it took me three months to realize I had spoken to two angels. That God had sent me two angels to send me the same message that I did not understand at the time. But you see, when you build a relationship with God, and for years he woke me up at 4 a.m., I, I don't have to set a clock. God wakes me up. And when he'd wake me up and I'd roll out of the bed, usually before I rolled out, my prayer was, please, God, let me go back to sleep. <laughs> Do you know what time it is? <laughs> you know, because I look at that with my eyes barely open. I was saying it reminded me of when my kids were little and they'd crawl in the bed and pull your eyes open. <laughs> you know, and you'd be like, really? <laughs> you know, you got toys. Can you go play with them and give me an hour? But that's when God touches us. But we don't want him to wake us up because it's uncomfortable for us. In the beginning, we're having to sacrifice something we enjoy, which is laying in bed. But laying in bed will send us straight to hell. You see, when Jesus came by the fig tree that bore no fruit, that fig tree was cast into outer darkness because it had no fruit. You see, it's time for us to have fruit. It's time for us to have people sitting around us. We can point to somebody, oh, I brought them to church. Oh, I brought them to church. I taught them a Bible study. Oh, I met them at the church and I prayed them through. And then we called the pastor and he had somebody meet us and baptize them. You know, that's the way it should be. But have we become so fat and happy in the church and with our own spiritualization? That we have got, we are here to minister to God. We are here to conform for Him, not for us. This is all about Jesus. It's not about us. And you see, in our country, it's about selfies and selfishness. And we don't understand the word of the meaning of the word minister. It should be used as a verb, which means to function as a minister of religion or to give aid or service. This church gives aid and service to tons of people. It reaches out all the time. But how many of us individually are reaching out? Or do you think if you give $100 to the Benevolence Fund, that's enough? What about volunteering at the homeless shelter? What about taking some coats down and handing them out if you've got 10 or 20 hanging in your closet? What about sharing what you have? Showing them what the real meaning of Christmas is. Showing them what Jesus, the word Jesus, really is. You see, we've got to get back to the basis. We've got to get back to what God wants us to do. Right. But when we give to God, we want something from God. You see, it's in our darkest midnight when God moves. It's when you can sing in the midnight hours. Acts 16, 22 through 26 says, And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison. It wasn't good enough to put them in jail. He had to put them in the deepest, darkest parts of the jail. If you think you're not feeling God, maybe you're in the deepest, darkest parts of the jail. It's time for you to start singing. So the Bible says it made their feet fast in the stocks. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises. It was at midnight that they did that. When my husband died, when he took his life, I'll never forget that night at the crafts. I was laying in that guest bedroom, Brother Macy, and I would, <coughs> excuse me, flip through songs. I would sleep an hour and then I'd wake up because it was a nightmare that wasn't going to end. And I would... I, when I would wake up, I would just click on another song from POA or somebody, and it would soothe.
soul and I would worship God. That was my dark night. That was one of my dark nights, one of my midnight hours. But God, because of a relationship with God, I knew what to do. I may not have done it exactly the way they might give you a formula, but let me tell you, all you need to do is pray, worship, and sing. God will do the rest. And then it says, verse 26, and suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bonds were loosed. And can I meddle just a minute? You know, Facebook, yeah. pastor, is this okay? <laughs> I went to my 30th class reunion a few weeks ago, maybe about 10, maybe a little longer than that. Anyway, I went to my 30th class reunion and I drove all the way from Texas to get there. You see, in high school, I was Pentecostal. And my last name was Wine. Let me give you the full picture. I was Wino, Wine, Winer. Let's see if she'll roll down the stairs. She rolls in church. Yeah, there was only three Pentecostals in the whole high school of a few hundred students. Yeah, I know you too. And so I go to this 30th class reunion. I drive in the parking lot. And I almost don't get out of my car. And the head cheerleader comes by and bangs on the hood. And she goes, you're coming in, aren't you? And I'm thinking, home's 30 minutes that way. <laughs> I might just go back to mom and dad's. Because you, you put a bunch of old people together and celebrating a class reunion, and it's like they all revert to being teenagers. <laughs> and I'm sitting there thinking, Lord, I really don't want to go in. But you see, when I was in high school, I never preached a message. But this book was on top of my books every day. Yeah. I never said a word. Right. But right. this book was on top of my books every That's day. Good. Yeah. You see? And then when Facebook came out, I posted inspirational stuff. You know, those cute little pictures that say, trust in the Lord. He'll take care of you. Whatever they say. And I post those pictures. And people say, you post too much. Well, you don't know who's going through something. And if you can use Facebook as a ministry, you can touch millions of souls just with the click of a button. If they could turn their world upside down with just their feet, and their voice, what can we do with the technology we have at our fingertips? Mm -hmm. So anyway, so I, 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 as a senior, I was never allowed to participate in school sports. Back then, you didn't go bowling, you didn't go roller skating, you didn't breathe wrong. And uh, so I never participated in anything. So I begged my parents, and my daddy wasn't in church, so I begged my mama to let me try out for the senior play. And lo and behold, the Pentecostal got the lead. I didn't just get a part, I got the lead. <laughs> and I became friends with the jocks and the cheerleaders. Not friendly, not friend friends, but like friendly with her, knew her. And that's when she hit that thing, I didn't realize how much of an impact I'd had on her life. I walk in, and they start applauding when I walked in that door, I almost ran out. I was waiting for a bucket of something to be dumped on me. You know, something to happen. And, and uh, as I'm signing in, all of a sudden, as they're applying, they quit, and, and the guy who was my son in that place steps forward. He's a criminal psychologist now. He steps forward and he goes, Susan, we want you to, the class of 1983 wants you to know a few things. And I'm thinking, oh, this ain't going to end well for me. <laughs> he said, first of all, you're, bon you're our bona fide class miracle. We've never met anybody that survived pancreatic cancer. Wow. And I'm sitting there going, well, okay, that ain't too bad. <laughs> and then Penny stepped forward and she said, we want you to know that you never preached us a message in high school. But every day when you put that Bible on top of your book, you preached us a message that your God was real. And then another, the third one stepped forward and said, and we want you to know that today you still preach us a message. You preach to us that God has never changed because you have not changed. You preach to us every day on Facebook when you post inspirational stuff. That you still believe what God has said. And I'm standing there in shock. I'm like, whoa. Didn't expect it to be a church service. You know? I think I could have preached a message right then and we could have had an altar call. Yeah. But you see, we miss opportunities because we're too wrapped up in us. We're too wrapped up in, in making sure we have the right gifts for our kids or making sure we have everything we need. What about your neighbors that have been out of work? 
Are their kids going to have Christmas this year? Would your kids really miss one present a piece if you took them over to their house? And all that you're giving them this year? Would my grandchildren really miss one or two outfits and all the stuff I bought for them this year? No, they wouldn't miss it. But you see, you've been so wrapped up in you, you don't even know they're out of work. You don't even know what's going on in their world. And if you would just take a little time out and pay attention, they might just need an invitation to church as well. But because we're so wrapped up in us, we've forgotten how to minister to God. And by forgetting our prayer life, we're not in tune with His Spirit. So we don't pay attention to those things. It all works together. You see, my children's generation, which is the 30-somethings and the 20-somethings, they haven't been to too many all-night prayer meetings. They haven't had to wait on God for anything. And when I was in Maryland at the end of that two-month revival, my daughter and my grandchildren came to church. And I wasn't supposed to preach. I told Pastor that this morning. And I was sitting on the platform, and right before church we found out there was an outbreak of COVID. What do you do? you got a building, 150 people you're looking at. Well, I didn't know it because I was getting there late because I had all these kids to ferry and to get there. I wasn't about to let them come after me. I wanted to make sure they were coming. <laughs> I wanted to see that they were seated in the building. And so I get to the platform, and I'm sitting there about five minutes before the pastor was to preach that morning. He walks over to me and goes, brace yourself, Sister Smith. And I'm like, okay, I'm braced. What? He said, you're preaching this morning. And I was like, I need to sit down, and I need to talk to God. I had five minutes. And I was like, Lord, this is 911. But you know what? God spoke to me. Why did he speak to me so quick? Because there was a relationship that's established every day where I minister to him, where I write in three verses, where I spend time in his word, where I pray. And yeah, I know a bunch of you work full time. You work 12 hour days. I've been you. I was a senior vice president. I get it. What about that car you drive in? How long do you have to sit in traffic? Can you not put on gospel music instead of country or rock? And listen for God to speak to you through music, but through His music. You see, if we just change a few things, you'll have more opportunities for the Lord to speak. But it's because we are too channeled one way. We don't have time for Him. We don't have time to listen to Him. God wants to talk to His church. He longs to have a relationship with us. And like I've told you before when I've been here, I really do like to sleep. So I really wish some of you would start talking to Him. On a regular basis so I can rest. I'm serious. I love my Jesus. But I also love to sleep. Okay? But it's the last days. And you're stupid if you don't believe that. I've got to keep an eye on the time. I'm sorry. I get lost. I forget I'm not overseas. Come on. You see, let me go to Genesis 46, 1 and 2. This is what happens when you have a relationship with God. Even when you've been a con man, even when you've conned your brother out of his inheritance and you've run from him because you're afraid he'll kill him. And Israel took his journey with all that he had and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices unto the God of his father Isaac. And God spake unto Israel in the visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, here am I. Why? If you look at the very last part of his life, when he goes to Egypt, he builds another altar before he enters Egypt to see his son. His life was full of building altars. His life was full of talking to God. You don't have to talk to God like these and those. Your prayers can be like mine sometimes. Really? You see, my future son-in-law, last year at Christmas, I went in and they had all these beers. I, I told Brother Macy about this. They brought in 24 packs of beer. And then, again, all these big fat prayers I have. These, these prayers really get action from God. <laughs> and I'm sitting there and I'm looking at this and I'm going, really, God? I thought I was a minister of the gospel. Am I really going to have to put up with this? Can't you stop this? That was it. Well, it took them till May to tell me what happened three weeks later. And the only reason they told me it was I was, I was there for my grandson's birthday party. And he had an ankle bracelet on and so my daughter and I go in the living room and I'm going to take a nap on the couch. And I said, okay. And she came in the rest too. I said, Leah, we got to talk about the elephant in the room. And she goes, what do you mean, Mom? I said, are you in danger? That's what I want to know. She goes, no, no. He got a DUI a few weeks after Christmas. And then I find out that the ankle bracelets these days can detect alcohol. So he hadn't had a drink since then. 
And then when he did get his license back a couple of months ago, the blowing go, they have a camera now, and they take a picture of you while you're blowing to start the car. And I'm like, there's no way for you to cheat on this now. Used to, you could cheat it. Now you can't. And I was like, when you let God take care of it, instead of you trying to take care of it, he does it in a much, much better way. Why do I tell these stories? Well, because Pastor likes them. And the other reason is because you need to know what God does today when you pray. How God moves today. It's great to know he did miracles in the Bible. It's great to know he shook the foundations of a prison. But sometimes we need to know he's going to shake the foundations of our families and bring our children back. Yeah. That's what we need to know is that God can send Gabriel to their bedroom if he has to. Yeah. But you see, we quit ministering to God somewhere along prosperity. Lane. And when we quit ministering to him, we lost him. Because we quit taking time to spend time with him. Instead of starting our day with some soft Christian music playing to get us in the tune, to get, to get us to where we're going to worship God, the news is on. You know it's going to be awful. Why turn it on? Why not turn on something that's going to make you have a good day, that's going to bless your day? Why not send your children out and pray over them in the morning and say, let me tell you something, baby. Today, in Jesus' name, you're the head and not the tail. You can stop the tail in Jesus' name. Anything comes against you, you have the power of God to say, God, take care of this, and he will take care of it. And we can see the foundations of high school shaking. Yes, that's right. But you see, we've got to get there with ministering to the Lord. And ministering to the Lord is not just prayer. What if they need help at the church? What if they need somebody to clean the toilets or the vacuum or whatever needs done? That's the form of ministering to the Lord. Pulpit ministry is the smallest part of it. When I'm packing suitcases and I'm trying to figure out how to buy more bottles and if I need to pick, take a can of, or a jar of peanut butter or bottles, well, I hear Brother Kilgore saying, put that peanut butter down. They need bottles. And the peanut butter loses. Much to my dismay, because I really don't like the food over there, so I starve. But I'm just telling you this so that you understand, ministering to God takes many different forms. It's time for us to understand that. It's time for us to truly minister to the Lord and understand maybe God wants us to wait on Him in our homes. Maybe that little kid that you have that just got the Holy Ghost that's five or six years old, maybe that child's going to give tongues and interpretation to you and tell you where you're going to take your next steps. But if you don't teach them how to wait on God, you'll never know. That's right. You can't blame the pastor. It starts at home. Right. And we've got to change our whole lives. And then this will change. And this will match that. And that was free. And if I'm in trouble, well, he'll take care of me after church. <laughs> Lastly, ministry doesn't always look like we think it will. Matthew 25, 34 through 40. Then shall the king say unto them in his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, and inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was a hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee a hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say to them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these, my brother, you have done it unto me. I've got about 10 minutes, 8.30, right? So what I want to do in these last 10 minutes, because I want to give us a few minutes at the end to pray, yeah. is when I was in Africa and the PayPal started coming in, you see, when I first went over there, well, when I left Zimbabwe to go to Botswana because I had to take care of the passport problem. Before the world shut down, I could see what was happening as the lights were going out. It, was, it had a certain migration, and I could see what was happening. So I had to get to Botswana, where I could take care of my passport easily. So I got to the capital. Uh, the missionary told me to get on a bus and take a bus. Well, bus stations are notoriously in the most worst part of town in any city. It doesn't matter wherever in the world you are. You're getting off in the worst part of town. And... I got on that bus, he sent a man to get me on the bus, he pointed, told the bus driver who I was, he handed the bus driver money to take care of me and to make sure I got to my final destination. I didn't get off that bus for five hours, I wasn't about, because they all looked alike. And knowing me, I'd get on the wrong bus and end up God knows where. So I stayed on that bus. And when I got to my final destination, there, a pastor was supposed to pick me up. 
And they gave me the name, but I didn't recognize the name. And I'm thinking, oh God, how am I going to know who's picking me up? And I preached a woman's conference the year before there. And, uh, and this man had done the music, actually. Anyway, when I saw Paul hit those steps, I almost jumped into his arms. I was so happy. Because there were all these other men at me, taxi man, taxi man, taxi man. And if you'd have gotten a taxi with them, there's no telling where they would have took you. So I didn't want to get no taxi with nobody I didn't know. And so, but he was a little Filipino guy. If I'd have jumped into his arms, we'd have had a problem. He'd have been flat on the ground hurting, big as I am and little as he was. So they took me there, and as I walked in that place, and I haven't told you and the, you guys this yet, Brother and Sister Macy, but as I walked in, God spoke to me, and he said, you're here to go shopping. You see, God had me on a clothing fast for a year and a half. And I said, shopping? Have you forgotten you put me on a fast? I'm not allowed to buy clothes. And God said, oh, you're not here to buy clothes. You're here to buy food. And I thought, do you know how much money's in the bank, God? I have enough to take care of this passport and $100. And I'm praying that's enough to get me to the airport I need to go to. And uh, he said, they're going to need food. And I said, okay. And so as I walked in, I set my backpack down. God spoke to me again. He said, you know that machine that you bought? And I said, yes, sir. He said, uh, you're here to give it to Brother Paul. And I went, uh-uh. I paid $260 for that. It was a little in-focus machine that I could travel with all over the world. And it would make a big screen like the ones here do. Had Bluetooth, Wi-Fi capabilities. I mean, it was awesome. The techie guys here would love it. It was the latest thing on the market at the time. And so I looked at his wife and I said, Sister Marvie, can you go get your husband I need him? Because I knew if I didn't give it to him then, I would have a rough night. Because God would be waking me up every little bit saying, why didn't you listen to me? Yeah. And I don't like those nights. I don't like them a bit. So he, she got him and I, I said, I have a gift for you. And it, it was almost like it was stuck to my hand. I didn't want to let go. And that's the way we are. We don't want to let go if it's something we love. But if it's something we love and God tells you to give it to somebody, trust me, the devil's not going to tell you to give something away. No, he's not going to tell you to feed people. He's not going to tell you to share your Christmas with somebody. He's not going to tell you to bring people food. But Jesus is. Jesus is saying, be my hands and be my feet. But we don't want to do that. And so he took it out of my hand. He goes, what's this? And I said, well, it's an in-focus machine, basically. And I explained to him what it would do. And he started to cry. He said, Sister Smith. You'll never believe this. But a few months ago, ours was stolen. And we couldn't afford to replace it. I felt lower than the floor I was standing on. Because he's trying to start a church. And the technology is vital. And actually, that became very important to the services that we began to do when Botswana shot down and the, shut down the military took over. But you see, every day we go out and buy food, and that goes to buying the cow that we killed in the meadow that some people thought was inhumane. But you get in a third world country, and you think you're not going to have food. All of a sudden, it doesn't matter how you kill that cow or how you slit that pig's throat. You're going to kill it, you're going to butcher it, and you're going to eat it. And you're going to be thankful. And when I left, because of what this church gave and other people gave, there was six months of food left. And a new freezer and gas cylinders to run the stoves so that they wouldn't have to worry about it for 12 people for six months. Now that is the Lord. That's ministry. That is ministering to people. Let's all stand. You see, the Lord wants you to know. It's 821. The Lord wants you to know tonight. He wants to use you to minister. He wants to use you to help others. You know, many people in this church have ministered to me through the years, given me food, given me money, and they had no clue. I had nothing when they handed it to me. No clue. But God knew my need. Because he's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He knows our thoughts before we think them. Our footsteps are ordered by him. And if you're ordered in the presence of somebody and they don't look like us and God says, hand them everything you've got. God did that to me one night to a girl who wore Daisy Duke shorts and a, one of those real tank tops. And she looked like she'd been beat up bad in Mississippi. I had just enough money, Brother Macy, to get to where I was going to preach. I was there to buy gas. Thank God for Brother Kraft. He sent me some money because <laughs> I told him what I'd done. 
And I, I said, the Lord told me to buy your kids anything they want in this store. And the whole time the words are pouring out of my mouth, I'm going, God, have you looked at my bank account? Do you know what I have, what I don't have? And so she goes in there and she picks up, she goes, why are you doing this? And then she gets one of the kids to come in. She tells them to go pick up a, a quarter sucker. And I'm like, no, ma'am, you misunderstood. I meant anything in this store they want. And she puts her hands over her little girl's arms. And she goes, why are you doing this? And I said, I'm a preacher of the gospel. And if I can't be a minister of the gospel, when I'm walking the streets, looking at needs, if I can't minister to people in need, I should never, ever grace another pulpit anywhere in the world. I should never, ever stand up and say anything about my Lord in public. And she started to cry, Brother Mason. And as we were walking out, she said, I'll tell you why you did this. I said, why? She goes, my aunt's a Pentecostal preacher. I'm a backslider. Could have been my daughter. Could have been your kids. Could have been your neighbors. Three quarter suckers. 75 cents for the price of a soul. Really? You're not going to share your Christmas? You're not going to share your abundance with somebody in need? Instead, you're going to stand back and judge them? You're going to stand back and say, they messed up. It's their problem. Their cars were possessed. They couldn't pay their bills. It's their problem. They need a ride to work and you happen to drive right past where they go to work. But you're too good. You don't want their smell to be in your car. Really? I want to be like Jesus. And to be like him, I must lay me down. I must lay me down to minister to him. I must get rid of me so that I can be more like him than I've ever been. I think it's time for us to pray. I think it's time for us to find a place to pray. And then when you get home, find a place to wait before God. Find a place. Pick up your Bible and start reading it. Let him speak to you through his word. He wants to move in this day. We need him more now than we ever have. But what will we sacrifice to have him? Pastor, I don't know how you guys do off the phone. Pray the seats. Okay, if you guys want to come forward, come forward. It's up to you if you want to pray. But I think it's we need a change tonight in us. So let's pray. I know I'm going to pray. I've been praying over this for weeks since I started praying. Let's pray.